foraging populations and things like that. And uh, he um, has got a deal lately with them where he's able to get um, access to the remains of the ones that are hunted and see what they've been eating. Mm. And so he's been doing some really interesting research out there, but um, very interested in um, essentially the hunter-gatherer um, mm -hmm. lifestyle that's there and then the, the interactions with the YY. And he's been teaching them um, how to use GIS to track foraging yeah, for the hunting too. Awesome. Oh, so. That's cool. He's very cool. He would be a natural for this, but he's <laughs> on sabbatical. <laughs> so we'll have to bring him around. All right. Okay. Can so, we put your water bottle down? Yes. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to cheat and use your website. Sure. Should I move to see? That's it was on the. Okay. All right. Oh, it keeps landing in Google's guys. I guess I'm just going to stick over here on the edge. I can see where I am on the screen. So welcome, everybody. Um, I know those of us here in person just kind of did introductions, but I want to do this for anybody who happens to be on Zoom. Um, this is Leslie de Souza, and she's a conservation biologist and explorer at the Field Museum. She's been doing a lot of interesting work looking at at risk communities and looking at at risk, um, not just communities, but also life, wildlife, yeah, yeah wildlife, wildlife and, and different groups, um, predominantly in the Amazonian region and especially in southern Guyana. And she is going to be giving us a talk today on Neotropical Fish and Conservation in the Amazon, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dina, and thank you all for being here. And anyone out in the, in the Zoom world or online world, thank you so much. I, um, the Amazon is a really big region, and so what I wanted to do is, is kind of focus in on an area that I see kind of my journey beginning um, studying neotropical fishes to kind of where I've been moving into in this direction here, thinking about like, how do we protect them? How do we protect not only the freshwater fishes, but the livelihood of people that depend on them, and then these beautiful, pristine rivers and forests that make these ecosystems so magnificent. So I'm gonna kind of focus in on a region called the Guyana Shield. It's, it's part of Amazonia biome in the northeastern corner of, of South America. And am I good in terms of where I, I walk and talk with you, my hands. You can walk and talk. <laughs> okay. uh, that's great. You're um, so the Guyana Shield is in the northeastern corner of South America, and this is some of the oldest rock on the globe. So over three and a half billion years old. It dates back to the Precambrian. Mm. Pre and they're characterized by these large tabletop mountains called tapuis, uh, large um, uh, grassland savannas, <coughs> and these huge granite outcrops. It's kind of magnificent to be in this region and you feel like you're in another world. And just to illustrate the remoteness of this region, Pico Neblina um, is the second tallest peak within the Guyana Shield and it was only discovered in the 1960s. I think it was on accident by a Brazilian Air Force or military pilot. And many of you might be familiar with this large, gorgeous tapui called Mount Roraima. This is thought to have inspired Sir Conan Doyle's Lost World. It's featured in that movie called Up, which anyone mm. has kids or don't have kids, I watched it before I ever had kids. Our grandkids <laughs> um, are familiar with this large tabletop mountain called Mount Roraima. It's so expansive. And one of the things that is really um, characteristic of the, the Guyana Shield is high endemism. And the Guyana Shield, that particular tapui has one third of the plants on the top of that tapu is only found there and nowhere else in the world. And you have values of up to 80 to 90% for especially uh, reptiles and amphibians that are found on these tabletop mountains when you look across the Guyana Shield. It's almost like a sky island because they, they really do kind of have their own unique populations. Hmm. Um, the Guyana Shield is also characterized by large, some of the largest intact primary forests on the globe. I think, you know, Southeastern Asia is, is one of the areas that rivals these large expanses of intact forests. And when you're flying over this region, it just goes on and on and on, this green, lush, green carpet. It just, 
is magnificent to think. And maybe, um, uh, I don't know, I became interested from that aerial perspective. I've always been wanting to be in the rivers, but flying over these large expanses of intact forest just, um, I don't know, just really draws the explorer, explorer's mind. The Gyna Shield is broken up by two lobes. You have the Western Shield and the Eastern Shield. And during most of the Cenozoic, there was thought that there was this northeast flowing river called the proto verbese which would have been pre-Amazon, because the Amazon River at this time had not been formed. Um, so it was one of the largest rivers in this northern part of, of South America. And then due to uh, the dynamic nature of, of geology and the shifting, um, these, this river fragmented into what you have is this northeastern flowing Rupununi River into the Essequibo River out into the, coast, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And then you have a shallow divide, and then you have the western, southeast flowing, southwest flowing Takatu River into the Bronco River, and then into the Negro, which flows into the Amazon, current Amazon. And so this is the modern configuration of the rivers in that region. But what you have in the very center of these two regions is called the Rupununi Wetlands and Savannah area. And I will be referring to it as the Rupununi portal because during the rainy season, this area becomes inundated and allows for a hydrological corridor between these ancient Guyana Shield rivers to the, one of the youngest rivers um, and the most diverse rivers in the world, the Amazon. And so you have in a, in a, a, like this kind of heart of these two places coming together. It's one of the only known seasonal connections on the globe. Um, it functions similarly to the Okavango, but not quite um, the same in that the diversity is a little bit different in this region from the Guyana Shield to the Amazon. But you have this incredible mixing of the waters between the Guyana Shield and the Amazon. And someone told me this right when I started my PhD, and I was like, well, do they, I mean, all fish are moving back and forth. It's all the same, right? So I'll get to that a little bit later. But um, when you go into the Rupununi, which is in southern Guyana, in the central, it's like in the waste of the country of Guyana, um, this is what you see. You see expansive grassland savannas during the dry season, and you see kind of pockets of wetlands. And then in the rainy season, it just becomes a sea. I mean, everything just looks like it's just one connection across the, the Rupununi portal. Mm, that's beautiful. And, um, and not all years, of course, the connections is as extensive as it is, and it's changed over the years, especially in the last 10 years, we can see that climate is really affecting um, the ways that the floods come into, the, into this region, but all of Amazonia. So in neotropical systems, you have kind of the rainy season and the dry season. It's not the same like in the temperate where you have all of these beautiful seasons. But this hydrological connection and the flooding is so vital for the migration and spawning of a lot of freshwater species. Mm. And I'm mainly focused on fish, but this is a corridor for many species. Um, in the dry season, it's a place where a lot of the mammals will move or um, lizards, you know, make migration across the savanna. Uh, it's also inhabited primarily by indigenous communities. They're called Amerindians in Guyana, where 60% of their food source comes from fish. This guy on the left, we were out collecting. I mean, I'm with a team of, <laughs> you know, collecting fish. I work in a natural history museum. We're using our nets and, you know, we were out there for a couple of hours and we got a bunch of cool fish, but he like comes out in like 10 minutes with all of these, you know, gorgeous big fish. And of course, as an ichthyologist, I'm really interested in small fish too, because that's where some of the really interesting diversity is. Mm. Um, but it's, a, it's an important primary source of protein for the communities. Every aspect of their livelihoods is connected to the forest and to the savannas and to the rivers for making dugout canoes, for their eat that palms to make their thatch roofed huts. Um, cassava is a main staple um, of their diet. And then this plant here is called the arrow plant, or arrow plant, and they use that to make the string for their bows and arrow. This is my friend Lisa who, um, grew the cotton, spinning the cotton, and made this beautiful hammock um, from this cotton. And this is, she's just sitting on the side 
of the river because our boat broke down and <laughs> we were like, well, we might be here for a couple of hours. And all of you who have worked in remote areas know how that is. You never know when that's going to just might as well get ready to take a nap. <laughs> uh, this is a place and I'm, I'm referring to this region in Guyana called the Rupanuni, where you have some of the densest populations of Amazonian megafauna. So here you have a tapir, the harpy eagle, largest bird of prey, um, the South American, uh, I'm thinking the scientific name, but you must expand the, the South American river, giant river turtle. Um, and these can be, I mean, this is not even the largest one we, we, we caught. Um, Capybara, the largest rodent in the world. Uh, this, this was really interesting. I'm not sure. I was leaving an expedition in Venezuela. I was, we were in a really remote part of the, um, the upper Orinoco River. And we, got, we came to a small town that had like one little restaurant. And we were like, oh, we're finally going to get some like food because <laughs> we've been in the jungle, you know, for so many weeks. I mean, it was at least that trip was probably two months. And then um, and uh, it was Semana Santa. So it was like Easter, we, the holiday. They were observing Semana Santa Easter week. And so we couldn't eat meat or fish or anything. And we could only eat uh, the Pope declared capybara fish so we could eat fish. I shouldn't say we couldn't eat fish. We could eat fish, but we had been eating a lot of fish on the river. And so we all had some capybara that day. And I remember like, I'll never look at that animal the same just because I was so desperate for something else. <laughs> and, then, and they were like, well, you can have capybara, but you can't have chicken. <laughs> um, the largest reptile in the Amazon, this is the black caiman. They have a really a friend of mine, Fernando on the right and his village monitors their po the population because it's such a dense population. Uh, giant river otters, these have come, they have declined so much, they, the values are around 1,500 individuals left, individuals. And the Rupununi has an incredible population. A lot of uh, scientists will come there to study this population because they're doing so well. You have um, important corridors through the Rupununi for jaguars. This is the largest wood stork, Jabiru. It looks like a guy in a tuxedo. That's what I always <laughs> think of when I see it. <laughs> and then the largest freshwater scale fish on the globe, which is the arapaima. And I'll come back to this a little bit later, but this is one, of, one that we tagged, and that's me on the right and my colleagues there. This is a fish that is in decline all throughout Amazonia, um, but is in a, health, a relatively healthy population. Mm -hmm. Even plants, so you have the largest water lily um, on the globe. What's the di diameter of those? They, uh, about four feet wow. across. There's a really famous picture in one of the communities that um, in the Rupununi where there's a baby on one of these and it's a postcard. I've seen it in like a Walgreens before and I was like, oh my God, that was taking in the, you know, this really remote place in Guyana. Um, they're really strong and they have beautiful flowers. And, and remnants of ancient civilizations. This is a remote, uh, an expedition we did in a really remote river um, in Southern Guyana. And we were finding petroglyphs everywhere that had never been documented before um, in Guyana. And of course, since then, we have shared these pictures with people that are working. So hopefully they <coughs> have some uh, people that are interested in coming down and figuring out like who were there and what were they doing and who you know who were they related to where did they move from but there are a lot of impending threats and i don't know if you've kept up with some of the the news around guyana but they discovered in 2019 i believe some of the largest deposits of oil off the coast of guyana mm -hmm. in the western hemisphere mm -hmm. and so there um i think exxon has already um uh established a couple of oil rigs there, but their GDP is going to quadruple. It's a very poor country, Guyana. It's probably the fourth, uh, I can't remember the, where they, they rank, but it's a very small country. It's a very poor country, but a lot of these threats are am amplified by this new discovery, and some of that is because of development. So there's interest in oil in the Rupununi. There's uh, <clears throat> illegal logging, some legal logging, illegal. There's mining, and then there's agriculture. And a lot of places 
in central Brazil, when you see Savannah, they're like, oh, we're going to rice or soy farms. And so there's a lot of investors coming into the Rupini looking to, um, to invest and change this really important ecosystem. And I think that um, when I first went there, what, what I, I kind of want to do, and this is a little bit of a journey from where I began to kind of where I feel like I'm developing and growing as a scientist. And I'm focusing just on Guyana, but my work is all over Amazonia. It's in Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, not as much in Venezuela in the last 10 years, but um, but I feel like Guyana was the first expedition that I did as a PhD student. And so I think that it feels like that's where the story began and it has kind of evolved. And so I wanna talk a little bit about kind of like just the initial interest in understanding fish communities and distributions in this unique portal that have this mixing between these drainage systems um, and doing system uh, systematics and taxonomy. Uh, a little bit about Arapaima um, and how that led to a regional conservation effort and how this is now going kind of scaling up to a national uh, freshwater priority areas analysis for the country. And so um, my first expedition was in 2003 and um, because I'm Brazilian, I thought, my advisor said, hey, we're going on an expedition in two months. Do you want to go to Guyana? I was like, yes. And, um, but then I remember then thinking, wait, Guyana? And then every time I give a talk about Guyana, people are like, wait, Africa? Are you going to Ghana? And I was like, <laughs> no. I didn't think that then, but I remember thinking, okay, I need to remember where Guyana is because it's not, was not on my radar as a place that I would go and didn't think it would transform my life the way uh, that it has. And we were talking about this earlier, Dina and I, about how expeditions are transformative and every single one has been. Um, but so this was the first one I decided and I didn't know that it would uh, lead to kind of the direction that I would go into for my dissertation and future work. But that first uh, photo in the left corner was seven miles and seven hours. And mm. I was the only girl on the trip. And I remember I was so green. I had no idea. You know, I was adventurous. I loved to hike. I loved to be outdoors. My family camped. You know, we were, I thought that that I, I, I was prepared for this, but I was not. <laughs> and I learned a lot about just, I don't know, this connection with the outdoors and nature in a way that I thought that I understood, but I had a different appreciation of that and for people that, that live every day of their lives this way. Um, and for me, it was about being in the waters. And I remember on that expedition, the, the, the older scientist on the ex, or the, older grad students, I should say, because they weren't necessarily the older scientists, but um, they were like, I mean, you know that you're going to get in the water and there's anacondas and there's piranhas. And I'm like, I want to collect piranhas. And they're like, aren't you afraid of getting eaten? Or, you know, there's all of these stories they were trying to scare me. And I thought, okay, I'm sticking through. I can do this. I don't know what they're talking about. And they're like, do you have your protective pants? And all of these hilarious stories about, um, working in this region. And yes, field work is dangerous. All of you are know that, right? Everywhere and all of your different disciplines require um, some aspect of danger. And this is, um, we collected fish everywhere. So we would collect at night, we'd sit gill nets. And that was always interesting, like the person who had to go and collect and check the gill net thing, because that is when anacondas would come in to eat the other fish or caiman would come in or j jaguars are on the bank. So you always kind of doubled up and then you had somebody with a flashlight, you know, putting, looking for eye shines and then, you know, the other person's in the net trying to get all the fish into the boat. Um, but we collected anywhere there was water to understand. And um, I didn't necessarily frame this in terms of questions because I feel like there's a lot of different projects that came from this work, but the initial question was really understanding the movement of fishes across the Rupununi portal and understanding how, um, what the distribution was. They're fish, they should just move across and that's not what I found. And so um, this is part of, of that work, collecting and preserving a lot of those specimens for the Field Museum, at the time Auburn University Natural History Museum, um, which has some of the largest neotropical fish um, in the US. Um, and then uh, working with local people. 
And over the years working with local people, I started really changing kind of the way that I was thinking about the work that we have been doing um, because I was seeing things from a different perspective and understanding their relationship to fish and the mammals or, you know, uh, just their natural resources. And this work, um, all of those expeditions for that first part of the work in an area about the size of Delaware, um, the Rupununi savannas and wetlands, that expanse, there's about 400 and probably now about 50 species in that region. And if you think about the Mississippi River, which is like, you know, covers half of, or just, it's easier to understand there's 190, not, not even 200 species in the Mississippi River. So this is an incredibly dense, I mean, really, really diverse place for, uh, for freshwater fishes and just gorgeous things like the largest anchovy in the world up on the top. I mean, the smallest anchovy <laughs> um, on the tip of a, my finger and then the puffer fish and then this hot pink thing. I, I mean, I, we were collecting that thing at night and we would get, it was a, speci a specific saying, we would call it a mini mesh and we would just kind of pull up sand and shake it and you could only get them at night. And um, I learned that from some of the other scientists on the trip and then just this bright pink fish and I was like, what in the world is this? And the crazy thing is that a lot of the local people had never seen some of these species either because they're not necessarily thinking about fish from an ichthyological perspective, they're thinking about food fishes, right? And so um, I learned a lot from that, from that perspective. Um, and one of the things that came from this is that there is this portal, but there is also another portal. And um, a lot of these, some of these papers are on my website, so you can find them there. But we looked and tried to understand a dis the distribution of the fishes in this region. They're not all crossing. Probably uh, two thirds, I mean, I'm sorry, two thirds of them move back and forth, but there's about, you know, a third that are on e either side of, of the portal, only on the Amazon side or only on the Essequibo side. And those tend to be specialists um, that are just, they're not going to move across a flooded savanna that has very different types of habitat and water chemistry. Mm. Um, then, you know, they might need like really clear water flowing streams from in the forest. But there was a second portal. So there's somewhere upriver um, across where we were finding fish that are crossing as well. And then this was kind of confirmed from local people that live in the area. I'm like, oh yeah, this area floods as well. So there's, you know, some interesting historical understanding of how the rivers formed in this region, which um, aligns with kind of what we found in, in this particular study. And this was just a really cool elevation map to show like here's this low lying area. Of course, there is a connection between the rivers. It doesn't look like that when you're on the ground in the dry season. But you know, this is just showing elevation. The line in the middle is just the divide between the Amazon on the left and the Esquibo on the right. And this is kind of a zoomed in area showing, okay, this is exactly where the water could move across those two river systems. So a lot of that work um, also generated new species. Um, one of the most, the very first one that I did with my advisor, John Armbruster, and on the left is named after the Makushi people for the Northern region of the Rupununi. And the interesting thing about that one and another species is that we were at camp and we would put the new species live in a separate bucket. And um, uh, we would to take pictures in the morning. So we had them live in a bucket. And then all of a sudden we see the fire going and we're like, what is going on? And they're cooking them and we're like, <laughs> I just remember oh, no. my advisor going, Whoa! species are like there are plenty of these here you know so it's not new to them but it was new to science and to John who's an expert in this group at the time who, who taught who's taught me everything I know about armored catfish um how, but, how big are they uh that that's probably about I mean they're they're tiny hmm. they can get big there are some lower creeds that can get you know it's considered to be bigger um, this panicolis is really small, um, but that, you know, that was one that we found on the opposite side. Um, and then recently we did um, one, a, a, 
kind of the guy in a shield, and these are the bushy nose plecos, which are the ones that have tentacles on the on the top of their heads. Um, it's only the males, and so we don't know why they have the tentacles, but it looks like at the very tip of those tentacles, it looks like um, there's a hypothesis that they could be mimicking eggs um, for mating because it, like I'm a good father, mate with me. So I don't know, but these are, um, these are generally in very clear water, um, lotic habitat, so flowing water around rocks. And so these are very sensitive to changes and alterations in, in waterways due to mining or um, other extractive activities, but also climate change. They need it. It's not like, quite like trout because you're in the Amazon, but <laughs> cooler waters that are, are they're moving. Um, but several, several new species um, uh, from a lot of those expeditions were still, there are many groups that were still finding experts to help describe some of these species because unless you know what's there, you can't do ecology properly or you can't answer questions for conservation and how to protect those species. And so it feels like I didn't think that was the direction that I wanted to go in in my career, but it, I understand the importance of like putting a name on something, if, especially if you find it in a different way than I thought before I started. So it's something that I feel like a responsibility to do, I should say, um, as a scientist, even though I'm more, I go into a different, I'm in a different kind of direction. So, so these all look benthic to me. They all look like bottom dwellers. Are they, are they not? No, they're all in different. Are you talking about lower creeds? Yeah. yeah. You mean just a picture. They're, I mean, so the, it varies. It varies a lot of them, like the one in the red eye, it's called the wood eating cat catfish, and that one is typically found in woody debris. Um, a lot of times we do grab like woody debris from the bottom of the river and pull it out onto the bank, and then you know we find a ton in there. Sometimes they're on in the edge on the river bank, they'll make little holes, and so they live in there. They're kind of all through through the column. The catfishes are typically like the, not the armored ones, but the skin catfishes are typically ones that you find benthic. Um, and, and just recently, this um, is in press now, but uh, myself and colleagues who've been doing work in Guyana are um, publishing a checklist of all of these freshwater fishes. And I don't know, I'd love to see a book one day, but we'll see if we get there. Um, books are hard. <laughs> um, but that work led to a lot of relationships with local people and communities. And at the time, um, this is a species, the arapaima, which is the largest freshwater scale fish in the world. They're native to the Amazon region, the Amazon basin itself, including the Essequibo. So we think that the way that it was got into Guyana was through the Rupununi portal and that it speciated because it's a species that's only known from Guyana. And it could be that it became isolated whenever those rivers were, you know, separating and uh, breaking, that they became isolated. And genetically now they look like they're different species and morphologically. So this is both morphology and genetics. But through that relationship, working closely with the people, um, oh, one thing about the species, you, these are obligate air breathers. And so they have to surface for, um, in order to survive. If you go to an aquarium like the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, you'll see them come up for air and take big gulps of air. But in the wild, it's the same thing. And so you can go into a pond. They love oxbow lakes and kind of calmer waters. You'll see them in the main stem of a river, but usually along the bank or an eddy. Um, but they're typically in oxbow lakes. And um, they're super calm and, well, that's what I thought. They're, they seem very peaceful and calm until they start eating. But um, these, uh, and most of Amazonia, are it's a delicacy in tropical South America. Mm. And most countries harvest them. There's a lot of farming for arapaima, but they've also been overfished. And so in Guyana, um, prior to the 1960s, they were seen by Amerindian communities as the mother of all fish, and so sacred. So they did not eat them. And then in the 1960s, Brazilians came over into Guyana working with Amerindians to harvest uh, arapaima. And so in the 1960s, for about 20, 25 years, it was an important economic resource for the communities. 
and an important fishery um, supporting Amerindian communities, as well as giant river otters, pelts, um, caiman. You know, there was a lot of, of people coming into this part of Guyana that were really taking out, take, really affecting the um, natural resources. And a lot of the local people didn't realize the impacts. So when you hear from the local people that have talked about this, they were like, we didn't know we were affecting our natural resources that way. We didn't know trapping macaws and um, selling green, green, the green tree boas and things like that. But the, the Arapaima, um, they also don't reach sexual maturity for four to five years. It's not quite like sturgeon, but it seems like it takes a long time and they don't, they don't necessarily reap every mature female doesn't re reproduce every rainy season. And so this is a population that would take a long time to bounce back. And so um, this is kind of showing you a little bit. These fish can get up to, you the prior to the like last 20 year, I mean, decade or so, up to 10 feet, maybe 12. People talk about 12 foot long air pipe. How I'm much not really they weigh? Sure. Almost 300 to 400 pounds. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so the ones that we were catching, the previous photo is the largest one that I tagged and it was eight feet and it was about 250 probably pounds. Mm -hmm. So these would be shared and distributed among a lot of different groups. Yeah, and go. for a community, yeah. for sure. And sometimes because they're, they're way, so, Guyana has um, prior, this is where I'm getting, I guess, um, they would be shared amongst the community members that one fish would feed, you know, a lot of people. Um, the, like I was saying, the previous fish were kind of led to this conversation with the Amerindian communities. They all get together to talk about issues in the communities, to talk about natural resource issues, and they wanted to do a project to protect Arapaima. They were leading in a, 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 an Arapaima county because they come up for um, oxygen, you can count them in ponds. Um, it does take training to do that because you don't want to count the same one twice and you want to know if it's a juvenile or if you want to know if it's an adult. An adult. Um, that's also why they're easy to overfish because all you have to do is wait for them to come up and then with bow and arrow or back then a harpoon, you know, they're easy to capture. Um, so they asked me the question, well, one particular village said, we want to protect our Arapaima. We have the densest population in Guyana. How do we do it? And how do we know that people are not um, harvesting the Arapaima that we protect? And I, I said, you know, what do you know about how they move and migrate between the rainy season and the dry season? So we started a telemetry project to monitor their movement between the rainy season and the dry season. Mm -hmm. And so we inserted radio uh, tags and track them for three years. Um, worked with local people to go out to find them in these ponds. We had probably 30 individuals tagged. Um, and the, the first step for me was to look at one that was in the fish collection at the Field Museum because I was like, how am I gonna do surgery on a fish that I don't even know what it looks like and where do I put the radio? Like, I don't know, all of a sudden I was reading telemetry projects and we've done a lot. There's, I mean, a lot of projects doing telemetry all over the world. And there weren't that many um, and never had been done with Arapaima at the time. And I thought, okay, we can do this. And prior to getting into the field to do this, I was felt confident from reading. And then I got to the field and I was like, what the hell am I doing? Oh my God, I can't believe I, I'm gonna do this. This is a huge fish, it's bigger than me. Like how am I, you know, just all of these doubts. And, um, but I knew that um, the local people had really important knowledge about these species and knew their behavioral patterns and knew um, a lot about where we could find them. And, um, and it took that work closely with the local people to make that project a success and to understand their movement patterns. And they didn't move that far. They stayed within this kind of 2,000 square kilometer area within the village. And what they do is during the rainy season, they move upriver and laterally into the forest or laterally into the forest and then go upriver. And so if you were able to kind of protect that area, then that's, you're uh, bound to protect most of the Arapaima in that region. What if they're predators? Usually when they're a juvenile. So the larger the adults, it's very difficult. Um, once they get really big, it's, they're a top predator. But usually when they're juveniles or younger, river otters can um, 
come into Congdon and get them, as well as Jaguars and Cayman. Those are the three that I've seen attack Arapaima, smaller ones. Yeah. So the Arapaima is an apex predator, mm -hmm. feeds on other fish. Mm -hmm. It's omnivorous. <clears throat> there was a paper a couple of years ago that showed um, all kinds of gut content, gut content uh, from fish to birds to frogs to <laughs> no, right, everything. 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 Yeah. <laughs> when you go to take them, they don't ever get, um, I don't know, they can't hurt you? Yes, they can. Okay. It was That's super dangerous. That's what I didn't know. <laughs> Sometimes ignorance is bliss because I, I didn't know how dangerous it was going to be until after we did almost 30 of them. I was like, oh my god, this is so dangerous. Um, because they're so big and their head is so bony that they are, I mean, if you, yeah, they use that head to just kind of, I mean, people have gotten knocked out before. No one on our team, <coughs> only one guy got his lip busted completely open because, you know, his, the, you kind of had to figure out where to stand. Um, I could have, I, I should, should have thought to put a video of doing a surgery because it, it really illustrates how to handle the fish. And so that's the part that I felt like was really important to work closely with the community because because they know they know and they hunted these and they fished for them before and now they're conserving them and so we would collect them we had a 200 foot stain really big big net that we would put out in a we would find one corral the arapaima and, and bring it closely to the shore and then once we got to a shallow place i would jump in with probably another two other people and we would grab the arapaima and then gently bring Arapaima closer to the shore, flip him over, take out four, two or three or four scales, make an incision, insert the radio, sew it up, tissue glue, <laughs> and then do that within less than four minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we would we would monitor that fish for about 24 hours wow. to make sure. But yes, like I mean, sometimes when I was doing the surgery, it would want to try to jump out, and then we would just. It almost felt like. It was similar when we would turn it over to, you know, how sharks go. Is it tonic that they, they kind of they, their behavior changes down, yeah. and they get really calm. Hmm. Um, but then when we flipped them over, it was just amazing. They would just be ready to run. So we would usually have to kind of hold them for a little while to make sure hmm. they were okay. But yes, they go ahead. I was just curious. You talked about that in the surgery, and I'm looking at the upper right hand picture. Obviously, that doesn't look like we're looking at entire fish yes. there that's later so this is a fish that was in the aquarium at the shed aquarium oh. and then went to the fish collection at the field museum um and so this was not a fish that i worked with or i mean it's a very old fish but it's in half so this mm -hmm. is the bottom half of the fish turned upside down and then this is the top half this is his head and his mouth um, and so I wanted to see like where, I wanted to look inside and see where I would insert the radio transmitter and it would be safe. And essentially the, the coelom, this body, the stomach area was just a huge cavity. So it's a perfect place for it, especially for this size fish. And they do that for sam, I mean, they do that for many species that are a lot smaller. Uh, the interesting thing about arapaima and some things about working in the field with local people that was so fascinating was the, a lot of the, the people that I worked with were like, hey, you know, the, they have biparental care. And so they both help to make the nest for their young. Mm -hmm. And they're, you, when you see um, the young, they're, the fry are on top of the head of, uh, of the adults. And they have, secrete a milky substance from their head. And it's the first, and the local people were like, oh, it's the milk for the arapaima. And I remember like being blown away about it then, and I saw it my, for my, like with my own eyes. And then probably four years ago, a paper came out where somebody actually looked at the um, the chemical makeup and was was able to show that the young are being fed by that or feeding on that, and there is part of their development. I'm like mind blown because <laughs> it's like what fish have milk too i mean it's not milk but <laughs> it's, so it's like nursing it's like nursing their babies it's, you know? yeah but it's some kind of it's a milky substance but it's not does not have any characteristics of milk but um they were they broke down the chemical makeup of this it's like a latex type that i don't know it's do just both the males and females mm -hmm. 
And how many fry did they typically have? Oh, millions. So, I mean, this isn't like they're showing great parental investment. It's just, it's it's yeah. in the water for the babies. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I mean, they'll secrete it, but you can see, and because I, I used to wonder, like, why are they right on top of the, the adult's head? And it's definitely in that area. And sometimes you'll see them swimming kind of apart from the adult, but they're always kind of hanging out with the adult. And the two of them, the male and the female, make huge depression nests. And they're, that's usually when one is out feeding, the other one's in with the young. And that, that was one thing that I realized is that when we were tagging fish, when they had young or they were mating, they were way more aggressive. I mean, they would use their head underwater, whereas they never did that during other times of the year. So it was very dangerous. <laughs> but like I said, I didn't know. So it was like, well, but I, with a fish that big, like Bob took me fishing one time in Alaska and um, the hell? The hell? Have you seen how? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're so they're huge. Barn doors. So I, I actually caught one, and then they have to kill it before they bring it on the boat because yeah. otherwise it could kill people on the boat. Oh, yeah. So it's, that was my curiosity. Yeah. It's like, how are you around a really big fish like that? Yeah. Well, and we didn't, um, you know, we tag them, and they those batteries stay in them for. We did a lot of pit tagging as well. So where you insert the pit tags and their muscle, but you could do that for like, we did that for like 300 individuals. Um, but with the radios, we only did it with 30. And, you know, we found ones that we did surgeries on mating, you know, and that's what didn't it So it didn't seem to have an effect. And there's studies that show that, but you never know, right? You yeah. never know how that affects. Um, okay, so anyway, this led to kind of an effort for this, these communities in the North Route Panuni where Arapaima are to create a conservation area. And so this was kind of initial, um, the, the polygon is still under, under the works, but um, this work is in partnership with indigenous communities, um, leaders, they are spearheading this. We help with technical support, we help with um, any aspect to help see these places get protected and species. We're also partnering with the government of Guyana, where um, we just got back from a meeting with the vice president who, um, which kind of leads me to this next section and it's connected kind of to the bigger picture. So I'm gonna to skip to that, um, which is this aquatic priority areas analysis. Um, is everybody okay? But not, I'm not, I don't have much longer, but I do wanna kind of take it. So that work really, <coughs> made me think about um, conservation like at a national scale and for freshwater species. So there was a priority areas analysis where you use the software called Marksman, which shows you where the, the hot spots are in the country. And most people do that focusing on terrestrial species and very few papers are out there looking at freshwater and including freshwater in addition to terrestrial species. And so the pandemic had just started I was working from home. I did have a one-year-old at the time, <laughs> but you know, I'm usually in the field so often that there's not a lot of time to do kind of focused work like this. So myself and others, uh, um, including uh, Nigel, who you all met, um, we started looking at um, a priority areas analysis, analysis for Guyana focused on freshwater species. And part of this motivation is that the Protected Areas Commission in Guyana covers, the Protected Areas System covers about 8.5% of the country. And they've signed on to 30 by 30, which is reaching 30% of their marine and the terrestrial water, uh, the marine waters um, within some kind of protection or conservation area or, you know, some form of protection by 2030. And so, um, they want to reach 17% by 2025 and then 30 by 2030. And so figuring out where those areas are is what priority analysis do. And so there was a terrestrial one that was published in 2017. Um, Jake uh, Bicknell led that study and I called him and was like, hey, we need to do this for fish. Let's, let's include freshwater fish and figure out how to do this where we can speak to both. And what was really cool about that study is that um, we were able to like quadruple the data set. Um, essentially what you do is you 
have all of this biodiversity information along around the country. So bringing in all of the experts for all of the different groups, uh, creating species distribution models to know kind of where um, you would expect them to be. And then you put those into a uh, Markson and the only difference is you set these up in watershed units. So you're looking at watersheds and you're, it's gonna tell you like, these are the areas and these are the hotspots. And then you have a whole another layer that uh, accounts for cost. So um, extractive industries or high population areas or urban areas and things like that. So the, the software is gonna look for an area at the least cost. Um, and so that, but yeah. And so um, what, what we found was that it actually was very similar to the terrestrial uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. And so um, even with the freshwater information, a lot of those areas overlapped and showed that, hey, these are just important biodiversity hotspot period. And so the Rupununi, so this map here shows you in the green are the national, are the protected area systems in uh, parks in Guyana. Down here on the bottom is where the YY are. They, they, they have a community owned conservation area. You have the Kanaku Mountains, you have Iwakurama National, uh, Kaitura National Park, and Shell Beach. And then in the gray, a little bit darker gray areas are the areas that came up in the priority areas analysis for both terrestrial and freshwater. And there were areas like this southeastern corner that you could see a, a spot here and there but we didn't have data for, and it was really hard to model. It was really hard for Markson to model um, and, and put a priority there because we didn't have any data. There's very little data for that northeast, that southeastern corner um, called the New River Triangle. And so there's, there's, it's almost like because it didn't come up, <laughs> it makes it seem like it's super important to consider as a priority area, um, as well as some of these other areas where we know they're endemic species or their um, uh, species that are uh, at risk or um, priority um, areas. And so one of the ancestors that I described recently is one that's endemic to the highland regions. It's only found there, nowhere else. I mean, one of mine in that area. So we're hoping that, you know, that was that's an example of putting a name on a species helps to um, be able to uh, make a case for it. Um, Without a name, it was just another ancestress, and so I don't think anybody would care. But so this is kind of what that um, priority areas analysis. We're doing that now. We're in conversations with the government and local people about the expansion plan for the protected area system in Guyana. And I feel like the journey kind of started because I was so fascinated by just exploration and looking for new species and learning about people and living and like living off the river, living in the forest with local people. I wouldn't have been able to do it without kind of learning from them um, to working together on a project to, to help protect a species like Arapaima in Guyana to, hey, can we create an area to protect this species and the people who live here to, I wanna take this to a national level to, to try to create, um, help the country expand the protected area system and protect this amazing biodiversity. So I'm gonna end there. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions um, if you have them. Um, hopefully I didn't run too long. Thank no, you. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> you can definitely take questions. Here, I, I have one, Liz. Um, in Alaska, there's a big, big push for uh, traditional knowledge and, and using indigenous guys for things other than driveless sled, mm -hmm. you know, polar bear guard, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And uh, is there a similar <coughs> initiative going on in, in that part of South America where it sounds like it, where you're bringing them in as as intelligent partners and actually trying to get some sustainable funding for them for things other than guides and schlepping gear. Yeah, for sure. I think there's kind of a terminology. It's traditional ecological knowledge. I think I yeah. see it like T E K, T -E -K. Um, <laughs> where um, 
which we have to do in the Arctic now. Yeah. Well, NSF requires that now. Well, but, but, yeah, but I, it's, I, it's very useful. It's turned out to be really valuable. Yeah, and I think it's for me because um, it's been the foundation of the success for the Arapaima work because it started out as building together. Because part of me was I could bring in a bunch of book knowledge about radio telemetry and, and ideas about how to do this, but you know, they're living, this is their backyard and their relationship with these animals and the ecosystem and predators, because that was the other thing. The Arapaima might be bleeding, and our piranha is going to run up and attack us while we're in the water you know, yeah. doing the surgery. And so, or Cayman would get in the net, and then, it, you know, there's all kinds of fun adventures that I don't know that I would have handled the right way had it not been. So it's yeah. partly some of the understandings or traditional knowledge, but also just the way that um, they know how to coexist in this environment. Yeah. I just, I remember one time being upriver a couple of months, I mean, it was probably, it's the six week mark or something like that. And I'm like, I'm just one of, I'm just another animal. I'm just another, you know, I'm part of this food chain, like anything, you yeah. know, and I think, food I, stuff. <laughs> yeah, I heard a jaguar when I was tr going to a pond. I mean, I saw one and I thought that he, if he wanted me, he could just take me. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, there's nothing about me that felt superior in any yeah. way. I just felt so much a part of the system in a way that I had never experience before and don't feel that way in Chicago. I feel like, oh, I definitely feel like I could be eaten at any time, <laughs> but in a different way. Yeah. Um, that was a good question though. Thank you. I was curious how long the Arapaima live. It feels like if they reach a certain age, they're kind of safe for the rest of their life, right? Yeah. And you know, I do think that there were individuals that seemed like they were really old and that they were really slow to react. Um, in certain situations that made me think like maybe there is an age when they're really big, but yet young. Um, and, but we don't know how long they live. So nobody's collected otoliths and like measured. We think, I mean, I think it's safe to say maybe 50 years. Well, your tracking know. devices like hang on. So like somebody, no. There are battery, there are batteries. And so they only lasted three years. And oh. so. That's the technology. Yeah. Right. But they could, you know, perhaps find one 100 years from now and be like, oh, hey, this is it. But, you know, people have estimated based on scales, too, because they have yeah. all their scales. They have growth rings like yeah. trees. And so mm -hmm. that's how they've been able to kind of track how much are they growing each year. And it depends on the rainy season. So mm -hmm. one year a fish may not put on a growth ring because the flood event wasn't as extensive as it should be. Mm -hmm. And so for whatever reason, I don't understand. That's definitely not something I know much about, but we don't know. We think a long time, but yeah. it's a long Actually, time. Some of the larger fish yeah. do live for very long. Time, yeah. So. And if they're, if those, their habitats are okay, they're going to be there for a while. And so places that are doing um, in Amazon, main stem, and those communities, they're doing a lot of community monitoring with Arapaima. They're doing counts, and then they have a percentage that they harvest and then they have a percentage that so they're like there's a balance and they know which ones are the mature females they to me that they, they, you can't you can't sex them alive i mean you have to be able it's they're they're not morphologically distinct and so it's hard to tell although local people say oh that's a male that's a female they're like i was like how can you tell well the female's a little wider here and i was like oh really <laughs> <laughs> they're like the males are like long and i'm just like hmm. <laughs> you need an anthropologist i know i know well i almost brought a, an ultrasound down one year because i wanted to just see if i could tell which ones yeah. during the breeding season which ones had eggs and then it does seem like the breeding females have these really vibrant orange scales and red scales during the so then but i don't know for sure what do they have you had a chance to taste them Yes. What did they taste like? I've never eaten one in Guyana. Well, actually, we there was one that was killed in Guyana. Um, I died uh, in a pond that dried out. Um, so we brought it back to the village. I had a hard time eating it, but I did try it there. But I've tried it in Brazil. And they're delicious. They're like boneless fish steaks. I mean, am amazing. Mm -hmm. If you ever go to Brazil and you can eat one that you know was harvested <laughs> legally, 
Um, they're really good. I mean, they're a delicacy. So they're kind of a white. Um, I'm trying to think what I could compare it to that's like, um, it's really hard to compare it. I started to think halibut, but I don't Yeah, know. I was going to ask halibut. I know. Yeah. But it feels like they're a little bit firmer. Okay. But. Hmm. Swordfish? <laughs> maybe swordfish. Yeah. Grouper. Maybe gr grouper's actually a little yeah. bit closer. Not the, not the cheeks, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're really delicious, and uh, the cool thing about doing that kind of work is that we do, we're doing so much um, sitting and tracking and waiting for them to come up and getting all this data, but like everything else that you see that's going on or fishing mm -hmm. because um, or behaviors that you would never capture because you're sitting there and hanging out. But. Hmm. Because they're so large, um, for those that do harvest them, um, not only for food, but is there any other use for them, like the oil? For I mean, yeah. it's a big fish. Um, yes. Is there any other byproducts that they make use of? Yeah, that's a great question because they use everything for anything that they harvest. Mm -hmm. Everything. So mm -hmm. these are called the bony tongue fish, Osteoglossiformes, and so they have bony fish. And the only other um, extant species is uh, arowana. And so they use that tongue as a file. Um, and so that's one use for just some of the bones, but they eat the stomach, they eat the oil. They, I mean, it does produce a lot of oil. And so they use that as well. Um, I'm trying to think just every aspect of the fish is being used and yeah. the skins. Can the oil be burned for illumination? I don't know. I've never yeah, seen them like do that. Oil, yeah. Oil so forth. Yeah. If that's something that, because you know, it needs to be harvested. That's yeah. I've never I've never seen that, but I don't know. They don't produce as much uh, they don't produce as much oil as the catfish do. Um, that's one thing. Um, local people will say. Oftentimes, when we come back from a trip, if we've been 